Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Founders Create sponsored by gaper.io. Today we have John Frankel. John Frankel is the founding founder of FFVC Ventures. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So, John, you've been an angel investor for more than 20 years now and you know just unfortunate times because of covid. So, how do you see the VC investor landscape changing because of this just 2020? Um, there's a lot actually to unpack from what is, you know, an apparently a very simple question. The, the, as VCs, we invest against growth and secular growth. And secular growth often happens when there's changes and disruption. And you know, I, you know, I've lived through quite a lot of change and disruption, but this last year has been something uh, special. <laughs> um, and I think coming out of similar such change and disruption, you end, you tend to see incredible companies form. And it's not just a recession. It's not just the changes in the economic calculus. It's cheaper to rent a place, hiring people may be cheaper. Uh, in this case, uh, hiring people remotely is as easy as hiring people in your zip code. But I think also there's just changes in behaviors of people. People are doing things different today than they've done before. And we've seen across our portfolio an acceleration of adoption of certain technologies that I don't think are a COVID bump, but actually just pulling technology you know, forward from the future in terms of adoption. Um, and there are, you know, many places one can look for those examples of where that is. But, um, but I think the bottom line is, as we look forward to coming out of this, and I'm not going to say we're past the worst because there's still a lot of unknowns, but I do want to believe we end 21 on a better footing than we started 21. And against that and opening up of the economy, I think there will be a considerable innovation that will happen. Um, the other thing to understand is that had we had this disruption in say 2000 or in 1990, 20 or 30 years ago, it would have had a deeper impact on more people. The fact that we now live, you know, I, I, I often look for these phrases and as soon as people stop using them, they actually happen. We stop talking about the paperless office, but we have it. Yeah. And so, so many businesses were able to move remotely and not notice anything. They didn't have to reach for their checkbooks. They didn't have to open up their books of account. Their records were all online, cloud, people could access them securely enough people have broadband, um, et cetera. All of these, you know, the computers that we use have moved. To, so there's layers of infrastructure have been built over the last 20, 30 years that just made this less um, of a challenge for so many businesses. Clearly in-person services, businesses massively impacted uh, and businesses that require a lot of shared space massively impacted. But for large chunks of the economy, no real impact on productivity in certain places, better productivity. And then the, the, the last thing is, I don't think this was clear. I think as, as we came into 2020, we didn't anticipate this would happen. Though I would say the, you know, at a firm in January, we started um, uh, talking to our portfolio companies about this. Uh, and by the end of February, we could shut down our office. Okay. So we, we, you know, we were early to it. But I, I will tell you, you know, if you listen to our Zoom calls with our LPs, where we ran through in April and May what the world looked like, we said we expected write-offs, we expected severe write-downs, we expected a material impact on portfolio valuations. We expected an impact on funding. And I think, you know, our latest note to our LPs was, 
you know, COVID has probably been a net boost to the portfolio that we didn't okay. have any write downs. Uh, okay. Sorry, we didn't have any write offs. We definitely had some write downs depending on timing of financing. But net net from a portfolio perspective, the, the acceleration we've seen has made our strongest companies stronger. The PPP program has helped our weakest companies get through this. Uh, and we don't have a cyclical bias to our portfolio. So we really don't invest in travel tech and hotel tech and restaurant tech. Okay. Um, and so against all that, um, our portfolio has actually emerged much stronger uh, than we would have anticipated um, uh, through all of this. So before I come down to the sectors that you see thriving in 2021, you mentioned change, right? So when it comes down to the due diligence and the waiting and everything happening over Zoom, what kind of changes you as an individual went through and are you kind of like comfortable in because prior to this you know there have been tweets and things going on two three years back ago you know vc saying that we don't invest in a startup that for which we have to drive like three hours and everything but now because of these kind of things happening so have you seen any change or you've kind of like adopted to it before even covid came we we've always invested remotely okay we have a broad reach of operation. Most of our companies uh, execute in the US, but they're not all US based. Uh, about 40% of our portfolio is in New York. And I think when we first started 12 years ago, it was closer to um, uh, it was closer to uh, 25%. Okay, so we've always invested remotely, we've always worked remotely, we live in a world of planes and email. Um, so that, that hasn't been an issue for us. I think if we were a value-based investor, then we would probably, like a lot of them, you know, sort of limit our radius based on, you know, you know uh, the range of a Tesla charge. Um, but as a New York, <laughs> like like York centered investor, uh, we've looked broadly and we have investments in many states across the country. The... Um, um, you know, the underlying change and the one that there's a lot of column inches on, and I don't think we've reached a conclusion on yet, is remote working. Zoom has been very helpful. Video calls are very helpful. Um, and at some level more efficient. Um, uh, Fred Wilson today on his blog um, talked in terms of how uh, uh, saving the 10 hours a week of commute and the wasted time for you know, lunches and other things that you can actually be substantially more efficient that a 35 hour at home week could be the same as a 50 hour in the office week, um, which I think is interesting. But I think it really depends where you are in the stage of your life. Sure. If, if you're someone like myself, who's got a developed career in business, um, and not just, just getting going and not having young kids at home. Remote working is very um, pleasant. If you've got three kids bouncing around at your feet yeah. and you're just starting your career and you need a lot of mentorship and training, it's more difficult to get that remotely. So I think there's that aspect. Also, if you live in a you know, tiny apartment spending 24 seven in that apartment is probably not as much fun. So I think there's different stages of lives and people. Um, however, I think some element of remote makes sense. People talk in terms of hybrid as if that was a known concept and it's really used as a placeholder today. And I think we were not sure what hybrid really looks like. Yeah. Um, you know, and then it comes down to real estate. If you're as a firm only going to use an office two days a week, do you really want to rent it for seven days a week? And so, you know, the, these questions we don't know the answer of. We, you know, we kick around, we talk to people and the like. Um, and if you, if you know, if you are going to have part of your workforce remote, you know, what's your office configuration like, etc. So there's there's lots of questions around that that come out. Um, but fund fundamentally, this has been a forced experiment. Um, and I think for a lot of people, the experiment 
has been surprisingly uh, positive. Okay. So now, you know, uh, you mentioned real estate. I'll come to that after that, more regards to co-working and how do you see that evolving? But before that, you know, which industries and sectors do you see gaining more traction in 2021 in regards to the investor behavior changing and everything in that regard? So over the last few years, we've been focused increasingly on applied, applied AI, drones, robotics, and fintech. And you go, well, that's an unusual mix. And at some level it is, but these are areas where we think there is strong secular growth and areas which are um, um, fashionable or not fashionable at a given point in time. Uh, I, I, let me give you an example on the drone side. You know, we invest in a company called Manor about a year and a half ago. Uh, and we spent about six months sort of getting to know the company and the like. And it was a ridiculous proposition. The delivery of food and other stuff via a drone. And, you know, there's seven points of failure from regulatory to technical uh, to logistics, business model, et cetera, reasons why this just doesn't make sense. COVID has been a huge accelerant. And today they're making, you know, tens of hopefully growing to hundreds of deliveries every day, hmm. commercially charging, flying drones over people's heads, flying drones at night, delivering food. And, you know, it's fascinating what people will order um, and why they order. And I think some of the learnings, you know, I was talking to the CEO this morning, some of the learnings are a bit like Starbucks, right? Who thought people would, you know, go out to a corner store and line up to buy coffee when they could just make it at home? And yet people do. And in the same way with, with drones, you think, is it the high value transactions or the low value transactions? And that's probably the wrong prism. It's the, does it save me getting in a car, driving somewhere, lining up and getting something, all that time, energy and effort, or can I open an app, press a button and four minutes later have a cup of coffee, a burrito, medicine dropped outside my door. And that through that prism, the demand is incredibly high. Um, and so, you know, we, we invested over a multi-year thesis that last mile delivery could only be done by drones, that this company that we invested in, Mana, had the um, capability um, uh, to, to go and deliver against it. Though there's, as I said, lots of points of failure. They've chopped away at these substantially. And now it's in production. And by the way, the delivery price is about one tenth the cost to Mana than it is to anyone else to do it, to you know, drive, put someone in the car and deliver it over. And so this fits into one tenth the price. Really means there's the ability to um, shift a lot of change of behavior. And then COVID's just been accelerant from a regulatory adoption. Uh, to consumer preference and the like. And we don't think it's a bump. We think it's a permanent change. So, so coming back to, we discussed real estate before this, you know, and September, 2019 onwards, you know, the news has been kind of like filled up with the WeWork debacle and those kind of things going on, right? Uh, and especially, you know, city like New York, you know, during the pandemic and everything, the times for everything, the building commercial real estate, everything is kind of like vacant. I spoke to a few co-working managers today and they're all running at like 10% capacity. So how do you see the commercial real estate and especially the, with the startup tech ecosystem, how do you see the co-working spaces evolving over the next few months or a couple of years? This is probably the worst time to own co-working spaces and probably the best time to start a co-working startup. Okay. So what do I mean by that? So, so let's think about cities. What's the benefit of New York City to a firm like us? A density of people, everybody around. You know, we have a meeting. It's a short commute for everybody from their office to our office or vice versa. 
So you've got this density of people. It's safe. You can walk on the streets and not feel you're going to get harassed and not feel unsafe. Um, there's a lot of places to go and get food for lunch. There's a lot of entertainment at night. There's a lot of restaurants. Okay. So that's why you like it. Yep. It today, right now, it doesn't fulfill any of those. Yep. So if we were in our office and we said meet at our office, that would be a high friction, difficult thing. I'm living in Maryland mm -hmm. at the moment, whatever. So you need the vaccine. You need people to be able to get back dense. Then the question is whether it's safe, whether the streets will feel safe to people. But you again, density helps that. Empty streets feel unsafe. Um, uh, and then you need density to fund the restaurants to be able to reopen or new restaurants to open up in their space. For the so there's been an unwinding of the benefits. Hmm. And the question is whether those wind back up. And I don't know. There is a concern that safety will take longer to come back, that crime has gone up substantially in the interim, and it doesn't just turn off with a switch, that taxes are going to be much higher, which will act as friction to businesses coming back. And so, you know, will New York come back? Absolutely. Yeah. When? I don't know. And again, if, we'll, if we're going to be working two days a week and everybody else is working two days a week, what then if there are different two days, meetings? How's that work? You know, so I think this hybrid concept, we actually have to prove out. Mm -hmm. I have a belief that it will come back more than the naysayers say, but it will be interesting. It'll be interesting um, uh, how that plays out. So, which uh, brings me to my next question in regards to, you've been an early stage investor all your life, right? And I think you have close to 100 active investments right now. We have 79, sorry, 76 active portfolio companies right now, though we're looking to add a couple more shortly. Right. Um, so I think we'll get that over 80. Okay. Um, um, you know, interestingly, as a firm, we're highly engaged. So we run with a large staff and we work hard with our portfolio companies when they stub their toe to help them succeed. In the industry, there's about 3,000 seed funded companies, which is at the point we start to invest. About 300 raise a series B and about 30 go public. Those are the like standard metrics each year, a little different. So only about 10% of seed funding companies go on to raise a series B. In our portfolio, we have 12 years of data and the data indicates to us that we're closer to 50% of wow. our seed funding companies raising a B. Um, now we're seed stage, so we're the earliest part of the stack. And we've been doing it 12 years. It's funny, like the first decade, you're just putting capital to work. Second decade, you're still putting capital to work, <laughs> but some of the capital starts coming back, right? Yeah. And, and so, you know, of our uh, 76 companies, 26 are at that Series B level. They, they, you know, worth 50 million or more. 16 are worth 100 million or more. And I think we've got a little over a half dozen of our companies that we think in the 2022 time range, we wouldn't be surprised if any of them went public. Wow. So our companies have grown to a size and a half. We've got you know a couple of companies that both are looking to raise, uh, hire over a hundred people um, uh, this year alone. You know, so there's a lot of growth in the portfolio. Our companies employ somewhere around about uh, 2,300 people. Uh, and we start investing when they employ, you know, three or four people. Three or three. So, you know, there's been a, a lot of growth. Um, uh, and and that's, that's kind of fun. Glad to hear that. But uh, and my question is in regards to the deal flows coming in. So have you seen the same amount of deal flows coming in uh, in 2020 compared to 2019? Or because, or 
was the number lower or higher? And why is the reason for that? Sorry, the same number of what coming in? Same number of uh, companies reaching out to you for investments in 2020, the early stage companies, or do you see the number declining in 2020? No, we're still looking at about 50 companies a week. Okay. I think that our expectation is the crop of companies in 2021 and 2022 will be particularly interesting. Okay. Uh, we think um, that this disruption wave we've seen will generate great companies. The people who are working at home are taking 20% of their time on a side project, and suddenly that blows up into being a company. That people's acceptance of different ways to do things today creates opportunities that slower companies um, uh, won't fulfill and they'll allow uh, other companies to move in. Uh, our focus primarily is on the enterprise side rather than consumer side, because we think the consumer side opportunities are often um, uh, eclipsed by the large consumer facing tech companies. Uh, but we see a lot of opportunity. So, okay. So now just rewinding back to, since you mentioned uh, discussions with your LPs in April, May and everything going on, what three pieces of advice were you giving or what key advices you were giving to the early stage founders who just kind of like started out a year back, a year and a half back or just before the pandemic and they were kind of like just caught up in all those kind of turbulence and where the talk or conversation was going on, increase your runways, survive for 18 months, don't raise, things like those, you know. So what I mean, advice were you giving to your companies? So... As a firm, we've always been focused on companies with business models. Okay. And most founders are not CPAs for some reason, um, but they need to make number informed decisions. So we actually built and spun out an accounting firm called Graphite Financial. Yeah. So there would be an accounting firm out there that could really help advise and educate uh, founders on making those decisions, making sure they have the right reporting to do that. Um, in addition, we, we build a very deep platform. We organize hundreds of events a year, and we use that to educate our founders, bring them together in groups and the like. So I, I think we just doubled down on those aspects, which is know your numbers, make number informed decisions, uh, be defensive. A lot of our companies trim costs. Um, uh, a lot of our companies really look to runway but this was very consistent with the mindset that we have before um, with them. And you know, when you start and you've got one product, it's fairly simple. When you get a second product, now you need a contribution margin, product line, p and and most CEOs go, huh? Mm -hmm. So, you know, understanding those dynamics, I think have been very important. Um, the, um, the, 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 but you asked three specific lessons. So let me, let me try and bring them up. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to say the lessons that we were telling them in April or May, but the lessons to think about now. Okay. The first one is we've always been wary of real estate. It can be a real um, millstone around your neck as a founder if things don't continue to grow up. And I think that's been highlighted. So being very sensitive to your real estate commitments is important. Second one is um, zip code. You know, take two companies, one which has the most talented people anywhere in the world, and one who has the most talented people who can commute to their office. Hmm. Over time, which one wins? And think about that. So, you know, we have some companies that were very remote first before. I remember we had one company that had 11 employees in 17, sorry, 17 employees in 11 locations. Yeah. So, you know, we had some companies very early. The others are like, I've got to be able to walk around and see everyone. You just need to think about that. And then, and then the third one, uh, you know, the third lesson really is one about, um, about understanding that you don't, the dilution you take is not the dilution you take when you raise capital. 
the yeah. dilution you take is how you spend the capital you raise. If you spend capital creatively, you will raise the next round at a higher valuation and it'll be less diluted. If you spend money badly, then the next round will be more diluted. So you have, you know, it's very easy if someone gives you a million dollars, $5 million, $10 million to feel an urgency to spend it and to put the capital to work, but you need to put it to work efficiently. So those, those would be three lessons. God. And they're all, you know, if you think about them, they're all about finance. They're all about numbers. Yeah. And a lot of entrepreneurs are driven by ideas and product and, and the like. And you have to have this other part of how I actually build a business uh, adjoining how you do things. Sure. So which brings me down to last question, you know, uh, what kind of like uh, changes have you done in your personal daily routine to be more productive through home or what kind of, have you done any change or it's kind of like the normal for you the same one you know it's and kind of funny. mental health primarily no 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 i get that it's it's kind of funny we have a lot of these things that we say we're going to do yeah. that we never get around to doing and a lot of them tie into personal health so one of the advantages of being locked into this Groundhog Day you know, notion of being under lockdown is actually discovering things about yourself. So I know I need about seven and a half hours sleep. Eight hours, not, not much different. You know, six and a half, much different. So that's something I've learned. Um, I, you know, and so really just understanding your own personal cadence and health is important. Uh, I've fitted in a couple of things that I've wanted to do for a while. So I've, um, uh, I try to meditate every day now, whereas before it was sporadic. Um, in addition, I, I take some simple thing. And for me, the, you, I have this belief as you grow older, you live in ever decreasing circles. You don't go skiing because the boots hurt. So no, you don't go there. Well, you go vacation is the same places. You tend to drop hobbies, not pick them up. So I decided I wanted to pick up a new exercise hobby. And so I just, you know, I jump rope 10 minutes a day. And I never really jumped rope before. So Actually, over the last few months, I've got better at it. Um, and it's, it's a peculiar exercise because you're literally standing on the spot, jumping up and down. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but it brings, it brings enormous benefit. So I think, I think picking something like that up, thinking about exercise, thinking about mental health, thinking about sleep and making those things that you then run the rest of the day around, I think is important. With working from home, and this is something we've talked about a lot um, with uh, folks at FFVC and with our portfolio companies, working from home is really living at the office. True. And so make sure that you take time out. Take an hour a day and don't work. Do something different. Jump rope, meditate, go for a walk, paint little figurines whatever it is that gets your mind somewhere else, but have some personal time like that. And every now and then just take a day off and don't work. So have, you know, vertical time and horizontal time to get yourself out of this. Cause it's very easy to do this 24 by seven. You know, my personal screen time last week was 14 hours a day, which is not on the healthy side, you know, you know, but you know, it's like, we're in front of screens all the time. You have to give yourself some cadence to do other things. And then hopefully with the vaccine rollout, you know, things will open up. The value of shared space will go up relative to where it's been recently. Yeah. Um, 
you know, we'll, we won't feel uncomfortable being on a train, breathing everyone's air. You won't feel comfortable being in, uncomfortable being in a cinema. I'm sure some people with PTSD, I'm sure some people will say, this is one of a billion viruses out there. So if I've changed my behavior to do this, how do I do it going forward? Maybe people won't shake hands anymore. Or maybe we'll go back to doing that. I mean, there's lots to learn and understand about how people come down from this. Um, but I think, I think, you know, it is a blessing and a curse to live in interesting times. These are interesting times. And try to, try to see the glasses half full, not half empty around the privations that people have had to suffer over the, over the last year. So true. John, it's always a pleasure talking to you. And thank you so much for being on our show. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thank you so much again. Thank you. And likewise. Cheers.